everyone. Welcome again to our second talk in the same day. This is our usual Sunday talk within the nine-sided circle. I'm one of your two hosts, Noor Kyle. And I am the other one of your two hosts, Mushtaq Ali. And as usual, we're so happy to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Some of you have joined us twice today, which is very ambitious, and we certainly appreciate it. It makes it a lot more fun for us to have you familiar faces present. So thank you. Um, yeah, this morning we talked about human adulthood, uh, the awake state, and abiding non-dual awareness and how those states interplay with one another and how they are different, but most importantly, how they enrich one another. So if you haven't had the chance to check that out, I recommend flipping through our recent YouTube videos. It's going to be the most recent one after this one. And you'll likely enjoy it if you enjoy this one. So take a look at that. And with that, we get to do our spiel. Our spiel? Our spiel. All right, let's do our spiel. By let let us, I mean let me do our spiel. <coughs> you are so talented. Uh, you can get me to do it, <laughs> which is even more important. So. First of all, we would like to thank you, if you are watching us on YouTube, uh, for taking the time to do this. I realize that we don't do the short form five minute videos like everybody else, so that you would actually come here and listen to us talk for an hour or so is both impressive and it makes us very, very grateful for you. Uh, second of all, if this is your, your first time here, or even if it's your 100th time here and you haven't yet, let me invite you to subscribe to our channel. There are many perks to, to subscribing to our channel, one of which is that God will like you more. I have heard this. And so feel free. Um, join up. And sometimes there are amusing prizes for members of the channel. Uh, and you never know when that's going to happen. We never know when it's going to happen. It just kind of appears out of nowhere. So yes. let me encourage you to mm -hmm. click that subscribe button, click the notification button, and join us for this incredible ride that we're taking with the nine-sided circle. And mm -hmm. if you would be so kind, we would be ever so grateful if you click that like button and let YouTube's algorithm know that we're kind of cool and they should promote us more. And if you would really like to make us happy, and who wouldn't, um, leave a comment. Who are you? What are you doing here? Why are you wasting your time listening to crazy people like us? We are really curious about that. So leave a, call, a comment down below and we try and answer every single comment uh, except for the really weird ones, and you never get to see those. Um, but we would be grateful for your comments. If you have suggestions, we'd like your suggestions even more. Um, nothing to do with jumping off tall buildings or anything like that, but the, the usual suggestions of what you might like us to talk about, um, you know, any of that kind of stuff. We'd love to hear that. So, leave us a comment. And there you have it, the spiel. Oh, yes. yes. And, and this lastly, is, yes. And lastly, this is Fun Drive. Mm -hmm. Not just Fun Drive, but Fun Drive. Um, we are inviting our listeners to help us keep on the air by making donations. Um, we recommend anywhere between one and one million dollars. Um, and you can find a link to our PayPal down below and you know, if you have a few spare coins laying around and you would like to see us be able to do more of this, please feel free to drop a donation in the hat and we will be even more grateful. And one presumably lucky person um, will be drawn at random from the people who donate or the people who say in the comments, I would like to donate, but I have no money because uh, you can do that, too. But that one lucky person will receive uh, a special one-hour consultation with either me or Noor or both of us on Zoom 
for free. Um, and there will be a couple of other uh, amusing prizes that we have picked up for everybody who's donated. So if you have uh, dropped some money in the hat already, you will be receiving special emails from us with uh, gratitude and a couple of small gifts. Yeah. And this is going on through the very beginning of next year. So yeah. probably January 1st, January 2nd, thereabouts, at which point we will round up all the names and figure out who the lucky person is. And we will send out all the, uh, the special gifts we have for you guys. Yeah. So there's all of that. Yeah. Very good. All right. So this evening we are going to be talking about hospitality. That's right. Yes. And this is Doesn't something that seems like a very spiritual subject. Does it? <laughs> Not at first glance, but I think we'll find that it is quite deep in actuality. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we could say that hospitality is one of the oldest and strongest of the spiritual rules for human beings. There is, uh, I don't know of a culture that doesn't have some sort of rules about hospitality in its past. The Greeks had it. Uh, they called hospitality xenos. Xenos means, you know, like an outsider or a foreigner or somebody who's outside of your circle. And, uh, in the Greek tradition, the old pagan Greek tradition, hospitality came under the rule of what they called Zeus, Zeus Zenos, uh, Zeus the foreigner, because the god Zeus would come down from Olympus and dress up as a raggedy old bum and go around and see who actually obeyed the laws of hospitality. And if somebody took him in and treated him well, they would end up being blessed. And if they scoffed at him and chased him down the road with sticks and rocks, yeah, that whole lightning bolts coming from the sky thing would, would show up. So, there is that from the old pagan traditions. Uh, that went into the... Uh, the Roman tradition, they kept it up. And we know that hospitality is important pretty much everywhere. Uh, no place more so than the Middle East. I mean, if you think about it, um, if you remember your Gospels, there's that part where Jesus said, I was hungry and you didn't feed me, and I was naked and you didn't clothe me, etc., etc., and then go to hell in a literal sense. Uh, <coughs> and, you know, the meaning of that pastor is, as you have done to the least of these, so you've done to me, which is like one of the keys to hospitality, um, treating everybody uh, as if they were the guest. Um, and then we have Sodom and Gomorrah. Everybody remembers Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Everybody thinks, oh, them, them Sodom dudes. It was actually the five cities of the plain of which Sodom and Gomorrah were the biggest. Uh, and, you know, God destroyed them because they were all gay and stuff and they were having gay pride. And that ain't true. <laughs> the God just... is cracking up. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because they indulged in rape and robbery and inhospitality. They violated the sacred laws of hospitality. And that's why they were destroyed. I don't think God cared one way or another who was gay and who was not gay. But he was not really down with people wanting to rape his angels. Or treating them badly because they were strangers. Now I realize if a Christian ever had the, the misfortune of reading, of listening to us, there, there could be some disputes, preferably down in the comments, and we can talk about that. 
but um, this is a very valid take on what happened. And above all else, it was the laws of hospitality that were violated. And it's a weird story. I mean, the whole Lot and his daughters and his wife and everything, and Lot trying to give his daughters to the crowd who wanted to abuse the angels and all that kind of stuff. But the bottom line was that Lot would do anything to protect his guests because back in the day, that's what you did. And so when we talk about hospitality, that's what we're talking about. This idea of a sacred obligation from the divine unity to humanity to treat each other as if any one of us might be an angel in disguise. Not the kind with 12 wings and 25 eyes and circles and arrows and all of that stuff. But, you know, the, the normal human-looking angels. So, does this have any meaning for us today when we don't expect angels to show up? Let me ask that as a non-rhetorical question. Yes. Who'd like to chime in? Sheree? How do you know I'm going to speak? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting to know all of your quirks, you guys. Uh, just saying. <laughs> I, was, I was just waiting to see if anybody else would say anything. But because if you... If you don't acknowledge the connection that we all have, that oneness <coughs> next to one, then you're just denying that if you don't have a hospitable practice. And it's very difficult to be nice to those who are not nice to you. And that's, that's the challenge. And there's a lot of that going on. So, you know, even... Even what I experienced yesterday, the instance of helping another person is um, something that just kicked in automatically because we're connected. You know, I don't know these people, they don't know me, but it was really interesting that in the middle of the storm, we just went, boom, help. Mm -hmm. like that. And that's all part of this hospitality and being um, caring towards another human being. That's, that's how I feel. How can it be any different now than it was? from the past. Nothing's changed. We're still human. We're still connected. We still love each other, don't we? <laughs> or want to. <laughs> well, to yeah. see somebody as precious, precious who's not your blood, that's, that's a challenge, but it's still there. Yeah, and I totally agree with you, and I, I want to make sure we get to hear from others, but I think we're probably going to touch back on that for sure. Yeah. Thank you, Shuri. Jayesh. So, uh, it's, a, it's a tradition, mostly in all uh, uh, at our places, that we welcome uh, people when somebody comes in at our house or in your life. So in Hindi or in Sanskrit, uh, a word is swagatam. Swagatam. So swagatam means swa, agatam. Swa means I, and agatam means I came. So it is not somebody else is coming. I only coming. When somebody else is coming, it is me coming to meet me. And recently we studied in the retreat that nothing but he, everything is he. So he only is coming to meet me. And so uh, that way, this uh, hospitality subject is a very crucial uh, for the spiritual uh, living, I guess. Yeah. And interestingly enough, of, of all of the places I've ever been all over the world, India is one of the places where I've experienced the most hospitality from people, being invited mm -hmm. to people's homes and having what 
was obviously more food than they would ever serve just laid out uh, and being made welcome even though I was a stranger and back in those days I was young I didn't even have the advantage of being all old and sage-like I was just a young kid and, some whippersnapper rolling yeah through. just some whippersnapper who was trying to hang out and not be an asshole yeah um, and you have and, to learn how not to be an asshole yeah, you have to learn how not to be a has asshole. And I I found that to be very moving. I, I found the same thing in Africa uh, and in, in Indonesia. Uh, in Africa, I was invited to this man's home. He worked in the, uh, the computer store beneath us. And so he said, come and have dinner with me. And so I came and I knew how much money this guy made. And he probably spent a month's salary on the food for us. Wow. Um, I was a little bit uh, slightly appalled that he would do that, you know, and <laughs> it was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to eat and enjoy it and be profoundly grateful. And then I made sure that he got some extra work after that in a, a sneaky way that he didn't even know it was me, but, uh, Things like that bring home what real hospitality is. And it's, it's actually more than we do now. You know, we, we will do nice things for people from time to time, but it's, you know, it doesn't, <clears throat> it doesn't make us sweat. Right. Yeah. There is this, this quality in really deeply effective hospitality of a of, of sacrifice of a bit of personal risk involved yes of vulnerability yeah of acting in trust even if the person who you're giving hospitality to might be a notorious bandit for all you know yeah and there are ways in which today in in you know quote unquote civilized societies where there's a lot of fear of, of even our neighbors, people who we see all the time and we are almost willfully disconnected from them. And yet sometimes we know more about people who live on the other side of the world and their struggles than we know about the people who live in our own neighborhoods because we just don't connect with them. But real hospitality is about the literal welcoming someone into your space and providing for them and caring for them. Shuri. This reminds me of stories I heard from my family. When we're a Chinese family that comes from New Guinea who live in Australia. And during the Second World War, they were literally chased out of the islands and brought to Australia. So they're big Chinese families and people would come up to me as a young person and say, who are your parents? Who are your grandparents? And when I would say their name, they go, I stayed at your grandparents' house. So my grandparents had nine children, but they welcomed anybody who came to their door and needed a place to rest. So in one house, they could have three families. One family had 17 children. So mm -hmm. that's a lot of kids. There'd be four kids in a single bed, you know, so you always share. But what point I want to make is despite recognizing me, they trusted God to provide because they all had very little resource because for one thing, Australia had the white Australia policy and did not like Chinese people. Not just Asians, they just hated Chinese. So to be able to pull yourself together as a group of people and look after each other, there wasn't, it was like, oh, I can't help you, sorry, I've got my kids. You know, you're just gonna have to find your own way. It's always about, ah, me, come in. I mean, and this is the same with all these different countries. Every story I've heard about this wonderful hospitality 
of opening the door, even when there's no need, they always have a sense of trust to the divine will provide. doesn't matter how it's going to happen. It will happen. And I think that is a really powerful part of the story, that you're not trusting on your own self to provide it. It's coming from the divine. Not sure when or how, but it will. <laughs> and it does. That's the amazing thing. Yeah. And in a culture where this is normalized, you do these things because you know people would do that for you as well if you found yourself in the opposite situation. And so there, if, if you're not doing it out of the goodness of your own heart, per se, you may be doing it because you want to make sure that someone will understand they should do that for you because you've done it as well. Does that make sense as well? Like there's this kind of reciprocal nature where you're normalizing this behavior. Yeah, but sometimes you don't expect anything in return because you know there no. is nothing to return. It may not come in your lifetime. It may right. not come to you, but it might come down to your generation succeeding. And I think that's a very healthy way of looking at it. And that's a preferred way of looking at it. Yeah. And ideally, you never expect return. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the point I was making in a practical sense is, let's say you find yourself in the desert, you know, in a Bedouin culture. Everybody's survival depends on the willingness of everybody else to share. Yep. And that's another culture where uh, hospitality amongst the Bedouins is legendary. Uh, you know, they will take you in and protect you and feed you and do whatever they can for you and never expect anything back. So what does that mean for us today? We're not Bedouins, more the pity. I personally would rather live in a tent and ride a camel than live in a city and ride an Uber. Though the Uber drivers don't spit on us as much. Typically not. Typically not. Fingers crossed we don't encounter that. Yes, Lovita. <laughs> so, what does that mean for us today? What if God knocked at your door. You know, for the Sufis, the guest is a metaphor for the divine presence as much as the beloved. There are all of these poems about the guest. You know, the, the, the guest comes and, and taking care of the guest. And that is a ongoing and underlying theme. As a matter of fact, at the end of this video, I will post a uh, one of Rumi's poems about guests that uh, y'all might find interesting. And I'll post it uh, recited in Farsi with English subtitles because it's much prettier in the original. But what does it mean? My if... thought on, sorry. Yes, please. My thought on this is to advance on the spiritual path, you've got to be open to new experiences. But the tendency is to want to be somewhat in control of what these new experiences might be. So I might be, oh, I'm going to read this particular book and I might learn something new from it. There's a feeling of, oh, I, I'm partly in, in control of what I might receive but to have a culture of inviting a stranger in that you don't know and to really listen to them while they're with you could be a, a truly new experience that you have no control over. And it might be just what you need. Now, having said that, I'm a product of a culture that has not 
been hospitable. I was, I've received no education in hospitability and I feel very lacking in that area. Understandably, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I was reading today about how people have this understanding of hospitality as, as being kind of like, oh, someone comes over and you pour them a glass of wine and you put out some cheese and crackers and you set the right like ambiance for your dinner party or whatever. But obviously we're talking about something that goes deeper than that. We're talking about providing someone not only food and possibly entertainment but safety and rest yeah and welcome mm -hmm. yeah not just welcome that style but true welcome i yeah i think i have the i have the experience also uh, uh i i can compare with the with the living in the city and in the village um when i was when i was little i when i live in this village people are like open open their house to anyone like anyone can visit anyone anytime like uh, it's a community like it's like a, 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 a what's that like it's like one a community mm -hmm. so um compared with the with living in the city it's like it's, it's not that easy you, you cannot just go to other people's house and and knock or just come in and just sit there and talk yeah <laughs> so i mean yeah i see that's the difference yeah we can barely it, ask for yeah, a it's, a, it, it, it's, a, it's a it's a challenge in this uh, in the city in the city life because i feel when i when i go back to 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 my hometown or my my uh, where, where, where where i live in the, in the village it's so easy. Like if I, if I want to go to someone else's house, I don't have to tell them. Just come, talk, and it's like it's like a, a community. It's a bonding type, a bonding things like one. So the community is like one big uh, family. So I think it's, that's another part of being kind to a guest will will create a, a good a great community. Yeah. And hospitality does create community. It's something when I was living in Tanzania, it was incredibly ev evident. Uh, I've, I have mentioned this story before, but I'm old, so I get to repeat myself. Um, of course. I was, I was walking back from uh, where I was teaching school, and it, you know, about a half a mile walk from the school to home. Uh, and I'm walking along on my block and I, I pass uh, this fellow who works in the building next to mine. And I, you know, kind of wave at him and everything and keep on walking. He says, no, wait, stop. Stop. This is Africa. We do things differently here. Come, sit down, have a cup of coffee with me. Relax. Tell me about your day. And it's like, oh. <laughs> it's like, yeah here they make time for each other and so from that day on it took me half again as long as usual to get home because i would stop and talk with anybody who wanted to talk with me and, <laughs> you know have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and whatever was going on and a totally different way of living yeah. You know, here everybody's locked behind doors. Their community was in the street. I feel like people, at least in my experience, they, I mean, living in LA at that time, even I experienced this, like you avert your eyes so that no one will talk to you. You just kind of want to be in your bubble un, you know, uninterrupted, totally avoidant of having anyone impinge on your solitude, basically. And unfortunately, that leads us to live pretty splintered lives. Very splintered communal lives.
So how did it feel, Mushtaq, when you were stopping and talking to everybody? Did you ever feel like, wow, I am just like extroverted out? <laughs> no, because it it was such a different way of uh, being mm. in general. It was like, um, it's hard to explain, but it was, it was, it was different and it was very welcoming especially because i was obviously an outsider i mean yeah. i was the only white face on the street i i did not live in the expat enclaves where they hide behind the walls and you know everything and have armed guards to keep the 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 actual tanzanians out i i preferred living just right there on the street with everybody else. And I think that they found that uh, endearing. Yeah, that you chose to put yourself out there. Yeah. And to perhaps, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you, you picked up on cues and stuff, but in situations like that, it's, it can be easy to feel self-conscious or like you don't know how to behave until you figure it out. Yeah. And you were willing yeah. to take on that that vulnerability. Yeah, and I, I started with a few things in my in, in my favor with that, it, having come from a, a pretty tribal culture in right. the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yep. yeah. I actually got one of the greatest compliments in my life. Uh, the first week I was teaching school in Tanzania, the, one of the English teachers invited me to come and check his work to, to see if he had been teaching his students well enough. And so I did, and I spent two hours talking with his class. We just dialogued, hung out. And at the end of it, this one woman said to me, you know, you don't act like a white man. You don't act like an Mzungu. I said, you act more like us, and it's it's unusual. And I was like, wow. Yeah, well, they saw something in you that they resonated with that may, in other contexts, go unseen or unperceived because people yeah. don't understand that. Yeah, well, after I had seen some other white folks in Tanzania, I, I got it because most of them are like talking down to the natives. Mm. Yeah. As opposed to uh, listening, because you could learn something. Yeah. But that's like one of the, I, if I think that the nicest things anybody ever said to me, that was one of them. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. And that was also part of their hospitality. Um, you know, they offered me the hospitality of their classroom and they were incredibly gracious about it. And they let me ask them all sorts of questions about who they were and, and what they did and why they needed to learn English and all of this kind of stuff. And in turn, they got to ask me anything they wanted. And that was oftentimes interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think you're gonna find an African wife while you're here? <laughs> you might have. Yeah, and this was said by a woman who was like looking at me, said, you know, African women are very passionate. <laughs> and um, I was like, yeah, I, I've heard this. And, and unfortunately, I'm an old Sufi, Sufi, you know, we were kind of monk-like and everything. And I pulled the Sufi card, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in that context with students, it's probably yeah smart oh, she was close to my age you know she was one of yeah. the older women in the class but still you know breaking hearts breaking hearts <laughs> jonathan i see you unmuted yes i mean i've i've had similar experiences to mushtak but the most hosp hospitable country that i ever visited was ethiopia and it's interesting that besides the obvious hospitable treatment, like welcoming me to their home and feeding me, the, for me, the most flattering and the most flattering experience I've ever had is being 
bombarded by questions. They want to know who I am, what everything about me, but with genuine interest. And I've not experienced that anywhere else. I mean, how, how can you be more hospitable than wanting to get to know someone with, with questions? That's a good point. Yeah, I, I would say every African country I was able to visit, they all had that quality to them. Even the Somalis, uh, you know, there were people in Somalia who would be happy to kill you for looking at them crossways. But in general, they, they were nice people. Ah, very cool. So it leaves us still with this question of how do we make hospitality an actual practice? You could go out and invite five or six homeless people to your house for Christmas dinner. That might be a bit much, but less than that, what do you do? How do you find that sense of hosp hospitality within yourself? Jay so Sometimes, yeah, so sometimes people come and uh, it happens that we like them. So it's easy to welcome them with open heart and uh, Very provide good hospitality. Yes. Yeah, but then there are people, uh, we are not uh, good along with them. And then they come and that is a testing time. And maybe we can uh, uh, observe ourselves and our inner reactions and overcome it and welcome them with the same spirit. Then that can be a step forward uh, in this direction. That is a most excellent point. Yeah. And that can, that can be anywhere. Um, you know, welcoming somebody to your home or meeting them on the street because hospitality is something you carry with you. You know, there's uh, one street person who I always stop and talk to when I'm, I'm in his neighborhood. And, uh, you know, He's, he's actually fairly personable and, uh, you know, he, he's had an incredibly difficult life. Um, and I think it's, he's surprised sometimes that somebody will stop and listen to him talk because mostly he talks and I listen. But yeah, uh, that is a really good way to practice hospitality in the world today. You're practicing, you know, being in the moment and, yeah, a, and being kind to people who mm -hmm. it's hard to be kind to. The socially awkward, the, uh, the inept at conversation, the people who don't understand the cues, but who don't have any badness in them. They just have never been socialized to the society. We know plenty of those. I might be one for them. <laughs> Rascals. Yeah. Yes. I think that ties it all in very neatly. You know, Jonathan's word of control and the word I was thinking of was awkward. When we surrender to what it is as it is, then you just don't know uh, what could unfold and so just allowing things to unfold sometimes it's time sometimes it's just your presence next to someone just to give them that little bit of connection especially a homeless person who doesn't have a lot of human connection and I call them the skin hungry people because they don't get a lot of human contact so being able to stay present don't control the situation I think there's a Another word I would use is being judgmental. 
disturbed, I've been judgmental, I'm trying to control who deserves my time or what. I've got to stop that and just see it as it comes. There was an opportunity brought to me by the divine. Do I see it? Do I sense it? Do I surrender myself to that awkwardness and see what unfolds in me? And I love that. Of course, all of this is not to say that we abdicate responsibility for our own safety naturally. It's just that we're allowing moment to moment a kind of free flowing observation and it's sensing of the situation without putting that story onto it that kind of leads the encounter for us. And that takes practice, I would think, especially for people who do tend to be fearful or, or reluctant for whatever reason to talk to people they don't know. And it's, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, please go. <laughs> Related to the but the practice that uh, Mustak said, maybe also uh, I was thinking about that uh, Rumi poems that uh, about the guest. Yes, so uh, it's also, is it is it is also uh, related with how we we accept uh, whatever comes to our minds as a guest. So we, we are yes, that's we that's are, the poem. It's called the guest house. Yeah, we we are. We are treat them as a guest and yeah. the kindness, loving kindness of whatever comes yes. to our minds. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I will read you the poem, which will be a good way to segue into the, the last part about this, which is about bees. Bees. Yes. yes. So poem. here's here's the guest house poem. It's better in Farsi, but uh, I would never be able to, to face Zainab if I butchered this with my incredibly bad Farsi. Um, this being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome the entire, welcome and entertain them all even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently weep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. And that last part is, I think, the most important part of all, that each guest is sent as a guide. So, as most of you have noticed, uh, one of the symbols that we constantly use is that of the bee. It's in our Enneagram logo. Uh, there's always a bee wandering around. Uh, yeah, we like bees. And there's reasons for that. Uh, because bees are, uh, in some ways, the embodiment of hospitality. Mm. Honeybees in particular. Honeybees in particular. Yeah. Yeah, we like the honeybees and so much uh, honeybees are so important that they have their own chapter in the Quran. Seriously. Uh, it's the chapter called the bee. And uh, I will read you a translation of it and I will put the Arabic up as a, a video in the at the tail end of this for people to listen to. Uh, called Surah An-Nahl. Um, and it basically says, and the Lord inspired the bee saying, choose you habitations in the hills and in the trees and in that which men have made. 
and eat of all the fruits and follow the ways of your Lord made smooth for you. There comes forth from their bellies a drink of different colors and hues, wherein is healing for mankind. Lo, herein indeed is a portent for people who reflect. That's the, the important two lines. And in some ways, that's the heart of what we're talking about tonight. What do you think, Noor? Mm. Well, you know, beasts can seem kind of scary, but in their way, they are extremely admirable creatures, right? So much of what they do is about community and about mutual support both within their hives, within their own communities, and in the wider environment of which they are a part, are there beings in their environment? And they, they embody hospitality. They, that's just what they do. That's just what they are. Say more about that. <laughs> Let me put you on the spot. I've been all right. doing all the talking yeah. tonight. Time to twist okay. the screw a little bit. Well, I have some thoughts on that. Yeah, so I was thinking earlier about what I've observed from bees, and I need a list in no real order, but I will share it with you guys. Um, they are excellent at teamwork. They know how to be interdependent in a very healthy way. They know how to share the load and share responsibility. They are committed to the task in front of them and they don't get distracted from it because they know it's important. They know how to labor and rest in proper measure for the benefit of everybody. They're loyal and they have faith that working together produces positive outcomes. They have excellent communication skills the they, best in the world. Yeah. yeah, they really do. They can get very specific in the things they're trying to communicate. Yeah. Um, they are efficient. They avoid wasting energy and they avoid wasting resources. They are only going to take what they need. They are very live and let live unless threatened in which case they are ready and willing to make a personal sacrifice of their own lives if necessary for the betterment of everyone who depends on them. And they know how to keep the energy flowing through mutual give and take. They always leave things better than they found them. And they know how to create a surplus which means not only are they hospitable, but they are medicine. They are basically, they create medicine and they essentially are medicine in and of who they are and what they do. And I think there's a lot to be said about emulating that for ourselves when we try and they to make very good neighbors <laughs> yeah they do don't they, they do so. actually yeah i mean everybody's like oh bees they'll sting you but unless you vex them they will not sting you yeah uh, i've i've had the pleasure of knowing several beekeepers <laughs> in my lifetime and you know we would go and stand right by the hives and the bees would be flying around doing their thing and they didn't mind uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure they, they actually recognize the beekeeper. Mm. Um, and it was a true symbiotic relationship. The humans kept the bees safe. The bees kept the humans in food and medicine. And not just honey, but propolis and uh, bee pollen, all of that sort of thing. Royal jelly. Yeah, all that stuff. the whole yeah. nine yards. Yep. So... Bees are, uh, when it comes to hospitality, bees are somebody to emulate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and we like them. That doesn't mean you need to go bother them and snuggle them or anything. <laughs> but I think they definitely are deserving of a high level of respect from us. Yeah. Bees are, are not terribly snuggly, but no. uh, they can be very friendly. Mm -hmm. I've had some bee friends. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But I love that that is one of our, um, our symbols, the bee. Yeah. Me too. So have we um, accomplished anything with our talk about uh, hospitality? Well, let's check in with people, shall we? Yeah. Let's David, what are you thinking about? I think this talk was a great accomplishment. <laughs> What makes you say that? <laughs> um, it reminds me that this this being here is a very uh, welcoming experience. Oh. You're always welcome here, David. Yeah. Thank you. Levita, how about you? Um. There were several things mentioned that I was like, yeah, I guess I agree with that, even though I had not thought about it until that mm -hmm. very moment. <clears throat> so um I I I thought it was a I thought it was a I thought it was a good talk. It's it's important. I think the thing I took, because I took some notes as usual, but I think the biggest thing. Um, about hospitality is um, that I took from this was making certain that you are present and that you see people. Yes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Um, not, can, yeah. Yeah. And that's not easy when, when emotions are high. Yeah. I, I was thinking more like um, I, I can tell that I'm definitely old because I was raised Catholic and I was taught that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was the hospitality thing. Oh, wow. Good. Yeah. yeah cool. um, <clears throat> but that was a really long time ago. So yeah. I don't know what they teach now. Yeah, it, it's um, fallen out of, out of vogue, especially with the evangelicals who want to like beat up on the gays. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure that God did not care if anybody in Sodom or Gomorrah was gay, but he was kind of pissed off about the rape and the robbery and the lack of hospitality. Yeah. And there is in the beat, Beatitudes, I think it's pronounced. Beatitudes. Yeah. It took me a week to be able to say that right. So. <laughs> um, <clears throat> where they talk about if you have all of these material things, but you don't have love, it's just a waste of time yeah yeah and and then i think about oh yeah like we've all been to some place where the spread was on there was food and um things to drink and there was a lot of stuff but you felt ignored or like you were a, a burden and so the hospitality wasn't really there even though if you just go by what it looked like it looked like all this person really did all this stuff. So. So you're saying bees have attitudes now? <laughs> <laughs> Bee attitudes, oh, yes. Oh, I'm sending you a cyber tomato, Jonathan. <laughs> I liked it though. I thought of it too. I just kept it to myself. Thanks, Jonathan. It was terrible, but it was fun. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, thanks, Levita. I'm, I'm, it's fascinating to know what falls by the wayside over time and what's old is new becomes old again. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lovita. Nancy, how about you? Oh, you got to unmute. First, Nancy, and after her, then I want to hear from Mustakim's cat. Kitty, yes. Yeah. Um, but Nancy first. There you are. Oh, yeah. Let, let me see. Um, well, I have to admit a lot of my initial reaction was, well, where does appropriate caution fit? Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing was I like the roomy poem a lot because welcoming, um, you know, whatever happens, whatever you're thinking is, yeah, sounds important. I have to admit, I was thinking about a person I was dealing with this weekend who I disliked for years, decades, because he just seems too clingy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where does something like that fit with hospitality where I'm afraid if I'm at all kind to him, he'll never go away. <laughs> you know, traditionally, there there is some uh, accommodation for that, isn't there, Mushtam? Yeah. Uh, there are, for instance, there are rules for uh, traveling Sufis. And one of them is if you go to a Sufi house, if you go to a Khanaga, um, you get to stay for three days. Mm -hmm. And they will feed you and give you a place to sleep. After three days, if you want to stay, you have to get special permission and you have to be put to work. Mm -hmm. um, consequently, most wandering dervishes stay at any given place for two and a half days. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's like a time limit on the amount of time during which you're expected to put yourself out and be inconvenienced yeah. and all. Yeah. Yeah. And part of the problem is that just as uh, it is really good to be able to offer uh, hospitality, there are rules for the guest as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, for Sufis, they say, never come empty handed to the house of the beloved. And the tradition is, even if all you could bring is uh, a leaf from a plant. Don't come empty handed. Yeah. That makes me think of Cherie and her her policy of like, even if you just bring me an apple, bring something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and so in in sane societies, there is this give and take. We don't live in a sane society, unfortunately. So we have to work these things out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a bit messy because we're not all following the same guidelines so we kind of have to just hold our own and perhaps set some boundaries on our end and and do it kindly yeah exactly yeah okay. i'm trying sure. yes need a little ed education and so if they don't come from that kind of culture or bringing something with them you know you can always just automatically say and you know, please come to dinner. Can you please bring a and da, 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 da. You know, and then there's no problem. There's no like expectation of, uh, of they will bring something because I did have a lady last week tell me she never took anything, not a thing, not a drink, nothing. And she's in her 70s. And I thought, wow. And I've thought about it. And I thought, if you're not brought up with that, always take something with you to, to contribute to the meal or whatever. You need to be educated on that. And she said she struggles with that. And I mm. thought, fair enough. But at least she knows she's struggling with it and not always turning up in it. And I thought sometimes you have to help some people with that so that it also is a service to them because whoever they go and have a place at someone else's table, they don't embarrass themselves because you didn't educate them a little bit. <laughs> So isn't that part of you know that community thing, the hospitality? Yeah. yeah. People about hospitality, and I mean, why we are doing that right now, teaching people about hospitality, how it can be. Yep. Yeah, I have one friend who is always. Uh, I mean, they're probably on the autism spectrum, and very sweet, 
but doesn't always get the cue that, okay, the host is ready to have everybody leave now. And when that person is my ride home, I try to like pick up on the cues and slowly guide us in the direction of making our exit. <laughs> Because I know that will be easier on the host, even if, if the lesson doesn't really stick, you know, at least I can make it easier on everybody for that particular occasion. Yeah. yeah. And I, it's it's all in love. Yeah. So that for Christmas last year, I told my whole family, you can come to dinner. It's between five and eight. <laughs> and then someone wrote back, eight, eight, that's so early. Uh, is that a COVID rule? I went, no, it's my <laughs> My rule going yes. at eight o'clock. Oh, okay, okay. And and they did. They were out by nine o'clock. It's typical Chinese. They're always an hour late. Yeah. So that actually gave me a little leeway as well. But I thought, love to have you, but can't have you staying till midnight. I'll be just cranky as all get out. And I thought, yep, no eight. <laughs> yeah. yeah. With There's a little no, bit no of time. right. With a bit of flexibility built in, you know, yeah, yeah. Great. I was talking with someone else and, you know, we talked for a while and they said something about how this has been a good conversation, mm. which was clearly a signal to, for me to end it. I was thinking how strange it was that this has been a good conversation is an invitation to bail instead of <laughs> say, isn't it great and continue. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, everybody has their, their quirks about how they want to communicate stuff like that. Holy that is very smokes. interesting. <laughs> Holy <laughs> smokes, I've had that happen. And I just kept yeah. talking. I thought it meant, let's keep going. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Mm. Who knows, I though? Think, it depends on the person. The, yeah. I think it's the fault of the Benny Jenner, Benny Jesuit. That's why they tied it to the higher power, <laughs> the, the the hospitality thing, because you know it's like I don't know you. You're here. You want what? You know. But God says that we must not do that. So mm, we will yes. feed you. Yes. Well, oh, I think we have worn out this subject. <laughs> <laughs> Good conversation. Yeah. <laughs> okay, bye. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yep. We're going to switch over to Brady Bunch mode here. And um, yeah. uh, any last thoughts, though? Yeah, any last thoughts? Up? Jayesh, Jonathan. Mr. Keen. I think everybody's good. Oh, Jayesh, did you? Yeah. Yes. So poem uh, was a very beautiful thing. So uh, anything coming up within inside mind, it's a guest. And guest is sent by God. And guest usually don't stay. <laughs> <laughs> So it's like everything is passing and you are just witnessing it. Yes, that is definitely the beauty of a visit, right? They come, they stay, they, they go. go. <laughs> 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 All right, everyone. This is our moment to exit gracefully, I suppose. And let's all wave to everybody who's watching on the replay and to each other. Yay. And we will see you all next week. Thank you. Same Bye. bat time, same bat station. <laughs>